Thank you. So next slide, Maria, please. So I will talk a little bit about a study that we've done that's been uh, gaining a lot of attention and been the inspiration and uh, foundation of the BTKD and Rhapsody Consortia. So this is about what Ken mentioned earlier, the heterogeneity of diabetes. Now, diabetes is is defined by having a high glucose, but there can be different reasons for why you have hypoglycemia. Um, for example, we have the type 1 diabetes and the latent autoimmune diabetes in adults that is caused by autoimmune reactions that destroy the insulin producing cells. Then there are some genetic variants that are relatively rare and the secondary diabetes. And then everyone who doesn't fit a more specific uh, type of diabetes is diagnosed with having type 2 diabetes. So di type 2 diabetes is a diagnosis of exclusion. Next. But even within the type 2 diabetes uh, group, there is a lot of heterogeneity. And these individuals differ with respect to the clinical characteristics and the risk of complications and how patients treat, uh, respond to treatment. So the goal of our project has been to divide these type 2 diabetes patients into smaller, more homogeneous groups that could be clinically useful for predicting who will develop complications and how disease will uh, progress. Next. So this was published in 2018 and gave uh, a lot of attention worldwide with very large um, heads in big journals stating that diabetes is five separate diseases, uh, which is a bit of an oversimplification. Um, I will tell you exactly what we have done, and we will have to see in the future whether it will uh, be called separate diseases. Um, so next. So what we did was a type of cluster analysis. So this is basically a data-driven method to group similar or individuals by similarity. So we used a large cohort of adult diabetes patients uh, who were registered right after diagnosis. And we selected a number of characteristics for these patients to put into the algorithm. This was whether they had the GAT65 autoantibodies that are characteristics of type 1 and LADA, how high their HbA1c was at diagnosis, so representing the severity, how high was the BMI, how old were they at diagnosis, and then measures of how good was the insulin secretion capacity and how bad was the insulin resistance. And then we let the computer group individuals next. and found that in different cohorts and in men and women separately, the patients were divided into five groups. So one group was the autoimmune patients, which includes the type 1 and LADA. And then there were four groups of type 2 diabetes patients with different uh, characteristics. Uh, next. And this has since been uh, replicated in numerous cohorts that we can reproducibly divide patients into these five groups. And I will just, if you go to the next slide, I will just very briefly present these groups. So there are two um, milder uh, groups. It's the largest group, which is the age-related diabetes. Um, which is about 40% of patients in our study that are relatively old and moderately overweight and have relatively good glucose uh, control and a low risk of complications. And then we have um, patients on the other side of the spectrum, which is uh, obese patients that are relatively young uh, at diabetes onset, who also have um, low glucose levels and relatively low complications risk of complications. However, we must remember that if you get your diabetes early, you're going to live with it for a long time. So there will be a long, a long time for your complications to develop. And we have, of course, only been able to study the first years. Then there are two more severe uh, groups. Uh, the autoimmune group, 
which was about 6% of the patients, um, that are all uh, autoantibody positive. And then there is the severe insulin deficient diabetes group, which is interesting because if we look at the insulin secretion up at the right, we can see that the insulin secretion is relatively similar in this group. And we can also see on the lower left that even though these patients get uh, insulin quite often, their uh, disease is difficult to control and they will have on an average higher HbA1c levels uh, over time. Um, next, we could also Anna, see that, yes. We are running out of time. Uh, do you yeah. mind if I just give you an opportunity to make one last, uh, last remark before we end? Because this is super interesting, but we cannot cover it all today. So I would okay. invite everyone to look at your website and the resources that we will put on our, on our event page and thematic page. A lot is already there. We'll put more. So just the concluding remarks before we move on to the Q&A, please. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Maria. So to summarize, we divided patients into three more severe forms of diabetes and two moderately severe forms of diabetes, where the patients with the most insulin deficiency had the highest risk of retinopathy and neuropathy, and the ones with insulin resistant had the highest risk of diabetic kidney disease and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And what this showed us was that it's important not to focus only on HbA1c when evaluating disease progression and response to therapy, because both um, the SID and the SIR patients develop complications very early and the insulin resistant patients do it in spite of having relatively good glucose control. And we also have genetic studies suggesting that there are some differences in the pathogenesis of these diabetes type. And we hope that this will um, allow us to prevent uh, complications and treat these um, diabetes um, patients with um, therapeutics that are more suited to the underlying uh, uh, deficits.